Okay, so I'm going to be talking about some of the uh, clinical characteristics that we're seeing at Columbia and compare that to some data we have from around the country and around the world. I'm going to kind of give two talks. Uh, the first one, uh, I want to thank the VPNS medical students. Uh, they abstracted data from our record uh, and created this data set, which uh, is and will be available. And they also created these slides, so thank you. And I'll go into a little more details on the next slide. There's the medical student leaders, the medical student team, and then some of the faculty who are involved. If you look at the lower right of the screen, there's a med archive reference. And so if you want to see the details, that's all on this, the paper that underlies what I'm showing you is all on med archive. Uh, this is a sample of patients. It's basically a consecutive sample from our first tested positive patient, all going through and it's looking at their course through the emergency department, the hospital, and the ICU. Um, the data were abstracted and updated every couple of days. Uh, this is, I'll skip that. Um, I'm going to show a number of tables for the first half and then go through some diagrams. I left the diagram, I left the tables, even though they're complex, so that in the talk you can go back to it and find the information. And I'll highlight specific things, uh, but I figured I'd just present the entire table. So if we're looking above the red line, we see that the uh, um, of the patients who arrived at an emergency department and either went home from there, went to the floor, or went to the ICU. Um, 14% uh, are still in the hospital, two-thirds are home, and one-fifth, 20%, have died. As we look at the other figures, you see that patients who required, and usually required intubation and went to the ICU, 38% did die. Um, the 11% who are discharged, that's discharged from the hospital. If you look below, 29% were extubated. That means 50% are still in the hospital. So we'll see what that number of mortality ends up being in the ICU over time. Some people have estimated to me that they think the figure is going to come in eventually around 50% at that point, but that's only of the ones who went to the ICU. But again, our over mortality was 20%. Looking below that red line, uh, just pointing out that uh, most patients are not COVID positive after seven days at arrival at the ED. Hold on. Uh, just looking at a little bit of the demographics, not unexpected. The patients are older and the older ones in the ICU, median 64 in the ICU, 55 at arriving in the ED and not going to the ICU. Overall, it's 60, age of 63. The other thing is for male, 55% that go home, but 66% of those who end up in the ICU. So again, some leaning to more severity in male patients. BMI around 30, but not showing the same um, predilection for more severe disease. But this is not a true study of that. So I don't want to remember this is a characterization study, which means we're just seeing how like tallies, counts of how often we see things. Uh, that's different than a uh, causal inference. So this study does not have causal inference. Here in this table, I'll just highlight the length of stay, um, at least of what we see so far. Uh, the mean is 13 days, the median is 11 days uh, in, um, in hospital. That's of all patients, including those who I believe, yes, including only those who went into the hospital that is going to the floor or going to the ICU. Here are the comorbidities we see, and as other reports have shown, um, almost two thirds have, and this is sorted in decreasing order. So hypertension, diabetes, pulmonary disease, <clears throat> chronic kidney disease, coronary artery disease, asthma, and congestive heart failure, and then it's less than 10% for the rest of them. Uh, so showing the same that we've seen in other uh, places around the city, around the country, around the world. And then these are the lower ones. So this is the second half of that table, so I won't spend time there. Here we see what medications are people on, and given that they're old and hypertensive, statins, ACE inhibitors, non-steroidals, PPIs, um, uh, that's, those are the ones above 10%, the rest make sense. Very few on hydroxychloroquine as outpatients, which makes sense. Uh, here are their symptoms, cough, fever, dyspnea, myalgias, diarrhea, chills, nausea and vomiting, headache, then uh, after that below 10%. Now, once they're in the hospital, so didn't go home from the emergency department, uh, here's what we see. Um, 
now these are this is the one set of slides that's not sorted so sorry for that i realize um hydroxychloroquine has been given to almost two-thirds of patients uh you can see the um the uh, proportion of those given other antiviral drugs and then you can see things like statins and ACE inhibitors continuing their therapy that they had as outpatients. Vasopressors being very high in the ICU, 94%. And then this is just the other half of the table showing more detail about which antibiotics they got and whether they got steroids, 50% in the ICU. Uh, looking at the com, now this one is again sorted. Complications, ARDS being the most common, then acute kidney insufficiency septic shock, inpatient dialysis, uh, and so on below that. A third of patients have required dialysis, a third of ICU patients have required dialysis, which is a large resource issue. Uh, now a little bit more graphical. Here's the patient time course. So this time, this is uh, patients who were intubated and when did they get intubated? Using the index time of their first symptom. So given a patient, and this tells you something about what to do, how to triage a patient. So you see from the time of their first symptom, there seems to be a, a rapid rise. So an early peak at three to four days. So there seems to be a first group or one group that seems to be intubated very quickly. It drops off maybe a little and peaks at around nine days, finally at 13 to 15 days. Um, so if you have a patient who's after two weeks after their symptoms started, usually they won't require intubation as far as we can tell. Uh, but don't think that just because the symptoms started that they won't require intubation. Here's a different view of it using as the index time, the time of arrival to the emergency department. And here, because they stayed home while their symptoms were mild, we see a peak, of course, when they first arrive at the ED, because that's what spurred them to come to the hospital, trailing off around 10 days. So again, uh, for doctors treating patients in the hospital, at the 10-day interval, there's a less likelihood that they'll require intubation. So that's just relevant for triage. This slide I included in the slide deck, but I think it's probably too fine uh, to see quickly. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide, but you can review this later, which shows the time course graphically of patients in the hospital where the uh, pink or purple is before intubation. These are the intubation patients and then blue while they're intubated, and then green extubated. So instead, I'll show you this curve, which is a Kaplan-Meier curve of time on a ventilator. The viewpoint of this curve is not uh, from the point of view of uh, survival, but just resource allocation that is ventilators. So this includes both patients who got extubated and patients who uh, died while on the respirator. And you see that the median time on the respirator is 12 days. Um, and then by uh, 20 days or three weeks, it's coming down. And in fact, if you look at patients, only patients that we've observed for at least 23 days, all of them were off the ventilator by then, most of them by being extubated, uh, just a couple by, uh, through a death. And that's shown off on the right-hand side of this figure. And then here's some contact information. These data will be available uh, or are available through the regular process, IRB and a track request. Uh, and then you can contact, say, Ray Chen, who really led the study, recognized, and the student leaders shown at the bottom, Michael, Sam, Cody, and Jonathan. Um, so now going on to the next study, the international one, Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics, or Odyssey, uh, which I presented two weeks ago. Shown here is the Odyssey Network, 300 researchers, 600 million patients. But of the ones with COVID, those are the ones shown with black circles with yellow or orange in the middle. So there are six sites that actually have COVID data. Now we've only completed the analysis for the four, so I'll show those in the next slide. Uh, these data are available. Also I'm at archive, there's a different reference in the lower right corner. Uh, first comorbidities, just to show that it's roughly the same, the VA, so we have Columbia, Stanford, the VA, and Korea. That's a national database in Korea. Um, Largely, the uh, comorbidities look similar across them, except the VA, which of course is a very biased sample. It's going to be uh, older men, kind of a bimodal distribution, so young people and older men. Uh, but putting that aside, uh, you can see a similar um, proportion across the different sites. And again, you can review this later or go down to MedArchive to see the details. 
So now <clears throat> people ask, well, is this really more uh, hypertension and metabolic syndrome, diabetes, obesity, or is it more age? Or, you know, so far people are thinking those are two independent factors that don't both contribute to the risk. Here, just looking at age and saying, well, why don't we compare this to influenza? How does COVID look compared to COVID uh, influenza patients, recent epidemics um, of who comes into the hospital? And what you can see here, the red is COVID-19, the gray is recent influenza, the gray is higher on the right, older age, the red is higher on the left, younger patients. So yes, this is a disease mostly of older comorbid patients, but what we're seeing here is compared to influenza, it's actually younger patients. This slide shows comorbidities. The x-axis is influenza, the y-axis is COVID-19. Uh, points that are below the diagonal mean that it's more common in COVID in, in influenza. So if you look at Columbia, CUIMC, upper left figure, most of the points are below the diagonal. That means that we're seeing worse comorbidities in the patients who are admitted with influenza than those who are admitted with COVID. Similar uh, in Stanford, which is called STAR OMOP here. Um, similar in the VA for the most part. And then HERA is Korea, a little bit different, and they had much younger patients. Then I can also look at uh, flu 2009 and 10, so more H1N1. Here you see the points starting to come above the line. So the pattern for COVID-19 looking more like H1N1 than like our traditional flu. Um, now, the study that produced this is actually, and all six databases I mentioned, the other two are Tufts and um, Spain, are available on the internet. So the website underlying these data have like 30,000 covariates, at least 10,000 covariates, and how often they appear in databases in patients who, uh, uh, in all patients who are COVID positive, and in patients who are COVID positive with at least a year of preceding data to make sure we got the comorbidities we should have gotten. And we compare for each database, at least if they have the data, uh, the recent influenza epidemics and the 2009-10 epidemics. Shown here is one example, which is Columbia, um, COVID-19 in the left blue column and influenza in the right. And there you can see a little bit more visually the difference in the age groups. So if you go into, and it's a little complicated on the website, but if you go to that website, data.odyssey.org, COVID-19 characterization hospitalization, you'll be able to get, so you have a specific uh, question about a specific disease, please just go to that website. If it's not in the paper, if it's a common disease, it may already be in the paper. My last slide um, is a study that Odyssey did on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin safety, which I mentioned previously. This is in pre-COVID patients comparing uh, hydroxychloroquine to sulfazalazine in rheumatoid arthritis is a cohort study with propensity score matching. It's on, I think, last revision in Lancet, but it's available on the archive right now on the lower right. 14 data sources, 300,000 users per group. No difference in 30-day safety. Yes, we did see a difference in cardiovascular safety for hydroxychloroquine in the long term, but short term didn't see a difference. And then we did a separate study of self-control case series, which allowed us to do all outpatients, and that confirmed the safety of hydroxychloroquine. But we do note that patients in the ICU with COVID have additional risks, so this may not be relevant to the ICU. In other words, if there are other things that prolong your QT interval, that doesn't mean that hydroxychloroquine is necessarily safe in those patients, but this is what we found on the outpatient side. If we add azithromycin to hydroxychloroquine and compare that to amoxicillin with hydroxychloroquine, we do see an increased 30-day risk of cardiovascular mortality uh, with chest pain and heart failure, uh, odds ratio of two for the cardiovascular mortality, which is uh, what you might expect to see with a QT prolongation. The caveats here are that the indication for azithromycin is stronger than amoxicillin. Uh, PS matching seems to be working. So in other words, if you look at balance between the two groups, like one fear is there are more beta agonists in the azithromycin. One minute, George. Thank you. Uh, more um, uh, lower airway disease in the azithromycin opposed to moxicillin, so then you may have more cardiac stimulants and therefore cause more arrhythmias. That's why I looked at beta agonists, but we see balance there, so maybe it is okay. And then again, my previous caveat that the risk in COVID-19 patients in the ICU does not equal the risk in uh, these who are rheumatoid arthritis in this group. Uh, so we show some good news about safety hydroxychloroquine in the 
short one, we show some indication there may be a concern of using it in concert with azithromycin, although that has to be balanced with the, with the uh, potential benefits. And uh, let me just say that the COVID-19 data mart that uh, Columbia has assembled, which that medical student data will be a part of, are available again through regular channels, through IRB, um, track request, and then the um, data navigators. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, George. Um, I see we have a question from Ibis Lopez. And Ibis, are you there? Or is that a, a, a false alarm, perhaps? Ibis? No. Um, George, if I could ask a couple of questions. Um, have you seen any evidence of, of recurrent infections, patients who, who come in positive and then seemingly become cured and then come back with, with the same symptoms? Um, we, I've read those since reports. Since we seem to be hearing a lot about this in the news. Exactly, so I've read those reports. Pardon me? I, exactly, I've read the, let me shut off my video just in case that helps. I've read those reports too, and I do not have, our data set doesn't really cover that. There is, um, there are patients coming back to the hospital potentially, but that's different. That doesn't mean they were ever negative. So uh, I don't have those data. I have to actually check and see if they may have become COVID negative and then positive again, but that doesn't mean they ever lost the infection. Okay. And I, I have another question, um, sort of looking ahead to the, to the fall. Um, have you had or heard of any patients that have um, co-infections of COVID and uh, the flu? And if so, what, what are the outcomes in those situations? We, um, let's see, in this data set, we did not look for it explicitly. And I don't think they recorded the influenza, like if they did a diagnostic test for influenza, I don't think that got recorded in the database. So I'd have to do that as a separate study, which should in theory be available in the data mart, but I didn't do that study. Um, any additional questions for George? Uh, yes, I have a question. George, um, it just, uh, you know, thank you for your talk, quite interesting. I was just wondering in terms of your morbidity, do you have any specific numbers as it relates to um, demographic and ethnic backgrounds? Yes, I mean, unfortunately, the, the demographic and ethnic data that we have recorded in electronic health record aren't the most reliable. I didn't show those results, but yes. And, um, and it shows similar to other studies that have been done. I, I, should have added that here. I can send you that. If you email me, I can uh, send you what we have. Okay, perfect. I will. Thank you. Um, and George, there's a couple of questions in the Q and A. Okay. Um, actually, quite a few. Um, if you could follow up with those, maybe I'll ask one of them, and that is: um, Is there comorbidity information on patients who are um, immunosuppressed or or cancer patients? Yeah, I mean, the rate of cancer in our database and others coming into it is, um, I think, 6%. And then if you look at the proportion in the ICU, it does go higher. So it seems like they, uh, you know, be perhaps uh, uh, because of the treatment are suffering from a more severe disease. There's a question of, well, what does the immunosuppression do? Does it help hurt or whatever? And that's a more detailed study that the cancer group at Columbia, I believe, is starting to look at.